didn't know that, John. I just picked that out of the I just Let me just quickly mention that there's a lot sure, of luck in entrepreneurship. Seconds. It's something that we don't necessarily talk about. But keep in mind that no matter how much you think, no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you prepare, uh, with your seconds. mentors, your coaches, your advisors, your university professors, luck plays a role in your success. The good luck, the bad luck, and the other luck uh, that, ha that happens. So be aware that you have to navigate the unexpected. You have to navigate divine providence. You have to na navigate what we call seconds. neuroserendipity, that you'll be sitting there and two neurons in your brain will bump into each other and suddenly clarity will come about something that you've Ten, struggled with for nine, months. If, if eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the Jay Moore Tech Talk Show. My name is John C. Morley, serial entrepreneur, and it is a pleasure to be with you uh, this wonderful Friday uh, evening here in the month of May. Uh, Marcus, it is always great to have you. How are you doing this fine uh, Friday night? I'm doing well, John. Very good to be with you, my friend. As well, always. that is great because, you know, being here is amazing because both Marcus and myself, we love to educate people Absolutely. and bring you great quality content. And tonight we have another great show. Yes, another great show. Yeah. I'm sure many of you are aware this week that uh, there was a little bit of a scare of people basically, um, how can I say, you know, not able to get gas, or at least this was in some particular places. Wow. Uh, they weren't able to get gas. And so, uh, what actually happened is probably the question you want to yeah, ask well, everyone, and that's a great happened? question. <laughs> well, the uh, Colonial Pipeline uh, service was actually interrupted. Oh, yes, man. that's correct, <laughs> uh, due to some ransomware. Now, I bet you didn't wow. figure that one out. But it's interesting because we had something similar to this uh, many, many years ago. And a closer look uh, at really what happened from this ransomware gang. And uh, the FBI actually confirmed um, that this was a new uh, ransomware group uh, that started out, and they're known as the Dark Side, okay? Oh, and wow. they were responsible for the attack that caused the Colonial Pipeline to shut down close to 5,500 miles of their very valuable resource in their pipeline. And just, you know, having all these barrels and places of gasoline and diesel and jet fuel that just were not able to be transported really was a problem. Yeah, and so, terrible. you know, they took a closer look at this gang and what they noticed was that this particular gang said that they are not going to harm companies that cannot afford to pay. They actually mm -hmm. take a look, uh, Marcus, I thought this was interesting yeah. at their financial, um, solvency of the company and wow. uh if they are able to pay then they attack them if they're not then they don't and so what i thought was very interesting about this is that this particular thing of you know of this ransomware and you know we had this happen with a utility you know not too long ago but i guess we didn't learn and so when this thing happened i think it really took people by surprise because you have to realize so these pipelines and we talk about disasters and challenges we're talking about how the pipelines are managed yeah. okay and how they use electronic servo motors and things like that and they were able to disrupt those systems to yes um oh. <laughs> stop the flow of this um you know crude oil coming down and then coming and turning into um our natural resource which uh, all of us in the country definitely need so Basically, what we learned is that um, they had many affiliates, uh, you know, with competing uh, ransomware programs, and they were advertising, you know, to being a victim of data leaks and things like that. And it was just very interesting because, you know, everyone's saying, you know, why should we be chosen over others? And, you know, heading ransomware companies to pick who you're going to use to attack a company. I mean, that's just like, uh, that's just like insane. Yeah, it is. And so totally. when we talk about this, the one thing I thought that was very, very interesting is that they said they will never go after a company, okay, that 
does not have the money. They also said that they're not going to attack companies uh, or things that are, let's say, related to the delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine. Hmm. They wouldn't interrupt any type of funerals. Uh, they wouldn't interrupt anything that had to do with medical uh, services that were needed. And so now this is what's going on. And also the fact that they made the statement is interesting because yeah. they're only looking to, if you will, screw up a certain type of company, a company that has so much resources that are just, according to them, extra and that they want them to pay. So I ask you a question. If your security is not in line, it's not a question of if you're going to be attacked, but when you're going to be attacked. And I don't mean to scare you. <laughs> However, it's really important that you understand that when we deal with hackers and they have some very big budgets, uh, yeah. it is amazing to me how something like this was not caught and that the proper security was not in place. I mean, we saw what happened in mid-April with the ransomware program that was announced uh, for affiliates to launch a distributed denial of service attack. And they got several people involved to help get that program deployed. And people were making money the more computers that they had that program on. I mean, this is just sick, Marcus. Yeah, it is. I'm I don't so know what else to say had... about it. Oh, um, people what... didn't know what was happening. And now to have this, you know, loaded cannon, you know, we have enough going on with the pandemic. Yeah. But I think people really need to sit down, Marcus, and and think about, you know, their network. And I don't just mean their security from the network perspective and how their software is being handled, but also their physical security. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen in this case, but I think it's really important that if you are going to run a company that has any type of uh, viability today, you've got to be secure. And if you're definitely a company uh, that is providing access to a public resource like water, uh, oil, gasoline, uh, anything like that, or anything that is really important for the sustainability of life and a community as a whole, then I think you really owe it to the community and to all the people. I mean, when I look at this, this picture, uh, uh, Marcus, from New Jersey all the way up to down to Texas, I should say, was interrupted. And so they just got this fixed, uh, you know, not too long ago, but it took w time for this, uh, you know, fuel to start flowing down the pipeline again. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you think about this and you talk about the, the dark side, this group, you know, what are best practices for a bad guy? And, you know, demanding large amounts of money is something that they do. And, of course, they do it in an encrypted way so nobody can track it. <laughs> and so based on the principles, they said this, and I want to quote, they will never attack medicine um, such as hospitals or any type of uh, medical care organization, uh, nursing homes, or companies that develop and participate uh, to a large extent in the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, any for funeral services, morgues, um, anything related to that, funeral homes, uh, education, schools, universities, uh, nonprofit organizations, or the government sector. Uh, they say that they go after companies um, and they actually request an amount of money, but they do their due diligence to make sure the company has those resources and can easily pay. And so they take time to figure out who they're going to attack. It's not just a willy-nilly attack. And basically they state, if you refuse to pay, uh, they publish all your data and store it on a torrent hmm. for six months. And then they send notification of the leak to the media and your partners and your customers. Wow. Oh, man. And they never provide you any decryptors. And... They say that they're taking their reputation very seriously. So if it's paid, all guarantees will be fulfilled. If you don't want to pay, you'll be added to the list of published companies that are on their blog. I mean, Marcus, this is just sick. This is yeah, just this is unbelievable like, uh, that man. somebody would go through this kind of an effort. Yeah. I cannot oh. 
believe this. I can't fan it. I really can't. I, really, I, I can't fan it myself. Well, listen, speaking okay. about things that are unbelievable, my next guest is really an amazing person. Uh, his name is Mr. John R. Dallas, uh, and he's our guest today. And um, he is a serial entrepreneur, similar to myself, uh, with multiple successful ventures uh, that were launched in New York, Chicago, the suburban Washington, D.C., and, of course, um, the Chicago greater, greater area. Uh, his first startup opened in 1974, and his current startup started in 2017. There were six successful ventures in between that. And, um, you know, he's been ahead of the curve many times for over six decades. At uh, only 10 years old, he asked his parents for an IBM-inspired toy computer called a Thinkatron. And that was in 1960. Wow, Marcus. I remember uh, asking uh, my parents for an Apple IIe when I was in school. But my first inspiration came when they actually won something. They won an Atari 800. And instead of me getting involved with the gaming aspect, I took the gaming cartridge out and loaded BASIC and started teaching myself beginner's all-purpose symbolic instructional code. 14 years later, at 24, he launched his first computer-based business, ETX Corporation, which he ran for 12 years before selling it in 1986 to a Wall Street firm. John was only 36. Now he spends most of his time and invests most of his philanthropic resources and volunteer energy on encouraging entrepreneurs and other leaders of all ages to focus on their own thinking skills more than on AI, which we all know is artificial intelligence, deep learning, robotics, and the like. He argues that our human brains need to be prioritized in the process of developing value for the business and other types of ventures we pursue. I agree with that so much, uh, John. Yeah. I think the order of doing things is so important because if you do something in the wrong order, let's just take a battle. Um, you're not going to win if you don't do the right things first, not even be alive to tell the story. Indeed. He majored in journalism and mass communications at Pittsburgh's Duquesne University and continued his studies at Columbia University in New York. For decades, um, he is now lecturing at a variety of uh, universities, colleges, high schools, and entrepreneurial incubators and accelerators. Uh, he currently lives in Chicago's Gold Coast neighborhood near Lake Michigan, which uh, he sees from his 32nd floor window. And so um, it, it's interesting, you know, what he has gone through and uh, being an entrepreneur and everything he's done, he has just made an amazing, um, I'm going to say contribution to fellow entrepreneurs and to our world. And it is an honor today, uh, Mr. John R. Dallas, to welcome you tonight to the Jay Moore Tech Talk Show to talk to us about entrepreneurship, uh, you know, where things are going and uh, how are you making a difference in entrepreneur's life to see that they actually have potential that maybe they don't realize inside. Again, please help me welcome to the Jay Moore Tech Talk Show tonight, Mr. John R. Dallas. Well, hey, everybody, it's John C. Morley with the Jay Moore Tech Talk Show. I am very pleased to have with us today uh, Mr. John R. Dallas, who has some really amazing insights, I understand, to share with us uh, just from his book and many of the amazing things he's doing. John, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, John. Thanks for the invitation. It is my pleasure. You know, you've had quite an amazing career just following it. I know you do so many things, but to start out with the largest uh, title uh, company in the world in Chicago, Chicago Title, and then you move from that to another pivot, which is Enclave. Tell us a little bit about how you went from the Chicago Title, maybe in a few moments, to how you got to doing what you're doing today, which is being the CEO of Enclave. How did that transpire in a, in a nugget? Oh, it was a, a rocky road. I'll just quickly tell you that when Chicago title was acquired by the number two player in the industry, we were number one at, at that at ju that juncture. Um, Business Week had a cover story called Chicago's Blues in which they uh, detailed what holds this giant, beautiful city of Chicago back economically. And as I read it, I thought, why not 
stick around here after we were acquired and see if I can be part of the process to uh, regenerate and to uh, revitalize uh, the, the greatness of this, uh, this city, this region. So we began a 21 year program of, of trying different things with the universities and other organizations. And in 2017, we started Enclave Learning and Earning Center in collaboration with Elk Grove Village, the largest industrial park in the United States, and uh, Wind Trust Bank, and also with Comcast uh, Business as a, as a sponsor. So uh, since 2017, we've been here focusing on some of the things that we've learned over that two decade span that hold this hold hold back this wonderful wonderful uh, city and region and uh, what we found out is a lot of these things are global so this is a local to global model for how to think differently about supporting entrepreneurs. You've got a wealth of knowledge, you know, and when we think about entrepreneurs, uh, myself being one as well, it's not for everybody, is it? It's not. It's not. I, I, I will say, however, that it, uh, the everybody comes in in this fashion. Everybody can have an entrepreneurial mindset. They don't necessarily have to become entrepreneurs. So here in this program, we, tr we uh, work with uh, chiefs of police, chiefs of fire departments, municipal leaders, uh, mayors of communities, uh, mm -hmm. not to turn them into entrepreneurs at all but to turn them into entrepreneurially minded individuals so that if they're meeting an entrepreneur, they understand the psychology, the sociology of what that entrepreneur is going through so that they can be more knowledgeable as they support the entrepreneurial process. We need to have entrepreneurs fuel this economy, particularly during the COVID recovery. Is there a difference when we talk about entrepreneurs and a mindset and a spirit? Is that the same thing or is it different? Well, my entrepreneurial mindset is is complex. It's uh, multi-layered. It's it's interdisciplinary. It, so the what we do here is we teach 32 different entrepreneurial mindsets that have been curated among the the clinical uh, literature in terms of how the mind has to be able to pivot from one mindset to another, and sometimes in a nanosecond, and sometimes multiple mindsets are operating at the same time. Uh, so the, the entrepreneurial mindset is a misnomer. It's a myth. It's one of the things that Silicon Valley has inadv inadvertently uh, put into uh, the, the uh, process on Shark Tank and all kinds of shows. Uh, they make it sound like there's a one way to think if you're an entrepreneur. Not so. Not so. They're the scientific method of thinking, all the other types of thinking are woven into what is collectively called the entrepreneurial mindset. Now, Typical people that are not entrepreneurs and they hold a job nine to five. I always say to people, if you have to punch a clock nine to five, you're not an entrepreneur. What do you feel about that statement? Well, if I if I understand you correctly, people who are entrepreneurs who are punching, they're, they're not going to punch a clock nine to five. No, I, entrepreneurs don't even know what a clock is. <laughs> we just kind of get up and I tell people, we do the work. If we're up to 11 or we're up to one, when yeah. it gets done, it gets done. We're not punching a clock. Not we're a, not, not a doing clock. a job. And John, you're on a, you're on a very hot topic here because one of the things that people believe motivates the entrepreneur and, and causes the entrepreneur to feel f a, a failing as if she or he is failing is the notion of being your own boss and you're going to have complete control over everything. Just wait until you have your first customer and you find out who's the boss. Wait till you have your first investor and find out who's the boss. Wait until you try to punch a clock while you're running an organization and you think you can get it all done in eight hours. It does not work that way. And the downside of this is it, has a, it takes a toll on our minds, our bodies, our souls, our family life, all the things that an entrepreneur goes through to keep that venture, however small or large it may be, to keep that moving and to keep it generating the revenue and the jobs and the tax payments, all the things that come to our economy through that, really, really quite complicated and absolutely misunderstood. Is there one thing, John, I don't know, that you wish that people uh, who are entrepreneurs uh, you know, would do? Is there something that they don't know that maybe will help them beat the odds of making it in the world today? 
Yes, we call it a cognitive edge. <laughs> get get your get your head together here because uh, the the notion of having a mind that really knows how to toggle between and among different ways of thinking from innovative thinking, strategic thinking, uh, 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 ma mathematical thinking, different different types of thinking really will give the person who's an entrepreneur a cognitive edge. Right now, they think the idea or the network that they have or, or the uh, money they might have in the bank through family or investors, that that gives them the edge. It isn't. What gives them the edge is the way they think things through thoroughly. We call it T4, think things through thoroughly. And most of us don't think things through thoroughly. We think, we think twice, we think things through, but not thoroughly. So I, I, I really wish more entrepreneurial minds would get in the habit of thinking deeper, wider, and higher about what they do every day. So it's more of what I'm hearing you say, John, is not to pull the trigger. I mean, when I was younger, I said, you know, you got to pull the trigger fast. But it's not about pulling the trigger fast. It's about pulling the trigger once you have thoroughly thought about which trigger or how you're going to pull it. Well, that's that's a good way. That's a good way to put it. I mean, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs just uh, barrel in, uh, barrel in, and start uh, building, building, building. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as they are contemporaneously thinking about what they're doing. So they they are they are running on parallel tracks. That they are trying this and uh, on uh, the one track, and they're thinking this on the other track. And how they try is complex. They, they test, 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 uh, they revise, they iterate, and they have to do the same thing with their minds. Unfortunately, the, the mind is uh, left as a second thought, uh, pardon the pun, uh, to the venture. So the venture takes priority. We say it's the other way around. Allow your mind to take the priority. So any organization, be it a, a municipality, a university, a, a chamber of commerce, a, any organization supporting entrepreneurship, uh, has to support the mind of the entrepreneurs, uh, the, the entrepreneurs of any age or any venture stage. We have here a member of a company, uh, uh, that uh, the CEO of a company, the company is 127 years old, and he's learned to grow this great company that has aerospace and other uh, uh, industries as clients and customers, but he's learned to incorporate an entrepreneurial mindset into this old company. He calls his 127-year-old company a startup, as does Goldman Sachs and other giant companies. So people are finally, finally, finally realizing that it's the mindset, it's the thinking process that keeps a company growing and prospering for years to come. I had another question, but you made me want to ask another one first. Go for Why it. is it, John, that we have taken so long to now believe this? Why has it taken so long to aspire to what it really is when we've been going down the wrong road? Well, a, a lot of that is because of pop culture. Over the years, uh, we have a tendency to focus on the success of a, of a giant company, be it Microsoft or Apple or uh, in years gone by, Kodak and Polaroid and, and different, different companies. Many of those brand names are, are slipping because of their lack of deeper, wider, and higher thinking if, if you study some of those, those companies. But the issue is that we wanted an easy way to make a buck. So the American dream had an element of unspoken uh, simplicity to it, that you come to America and you get rich. That doesn't work. It's uh, come to America and think, 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 think about how, how, how to get rich if you are driven for money. But research has told us that most people are driven not by wealth, not by the pursuit of wealth, but by the pursuit of significance in their field of interest, their field of endeavor, the area of, of subject matter expertise, or even more personally, their, uh, their significance in their family unit. If they're a middle child, they have uh, high performing siblings. Uh, their opportunity with entrepreneurship is to have significance in the family, in the neighborhood, in the community, the region, the world. And so that notion of significance is really what drives the entrepreneurial mind, not money. It's not simple. It's complex. Fascinating.
if I was to give you a microphone, which you already have right now, but let's just say we could talk to every single person in the universe. Now, we reach a lot of people, but we're not reaching everyone in the universe yet. What would you tell someone if you had just one minute to tell everyone something that was so important and they were all going to listen to you for just one minute? What would that be, John? Oh, oh, oh that's, a, that's a cruel question. Learn the word metacognition, M E T A. C O G N I T I O N, metacognition. Google it. Look at Wikipedia. Uh, they're teaching it at elementary schools and it's going all the way up into uh, senior most learning and development programs and mindset development uh, curricula. Metacognition means thinking about how you're thinking about your thinking because we think so simplistically about such complex problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, the issues of COVID recovery require complex thinking. And so if we're thinking the same way in 2021 that we were thinking in 2019, we're not going to get to where we need to go. So metacognition, the notion of thinking about how you're thinking on a daily basis becomes a habit. It becomes a cognitive uh, uh, practice that allows us to build our, our lives, build our ventures and build our communities and the world around us. Uh, so metacognition, that would be the number one thing that comes to mind. All right. The rest of those million people can tune out now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was, I just want to mention, you know, that was 56 seconds. I didn't even oh. use my whole my I, I know I noticed you were like right there. That was <laughs> So when people go into a job and then they decide to become an entrepreneur, what should people that have been told to go into a job? I mean, I was before I started my companies, which I actually started uh, when I was in college, but I still got a part-time job when I got out of college. And for me, it was the fact that people weren't treating me well and weren't appreciating my value. I worked for a government agency and I was only doing it part-time, but I knew it was going to be part-time and I was going to do something else, like start, like continue my company that I started in college. What are the telltale signs to be able, and I know this is a loaded question, but is there like, I don't know, four or five points that somebody could do like a checklist to say, hey, I'm I'm, uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I have the, let's say the caliber, or I have what it's going to take to succeed. <clears throat> like if you were going to go and let's say be a carpenter, well, there's certain skills you need, right, to be able to, to uh, build a house. Now, I'm not going to protest that I can do that. I've used a hammer and I could probably, you know, cut some wood, but don't think that you're going to get anything quality out of me, at least in, in woodworking. So is there like some signs that we could give uh, people maybe that might be working in a job today to decide if they should be moving toward entrepreneurship? What a good question. And I, I, I having heard the question the way you posed it, John, I think I, I need to uh, write a paper that's uh, that's designed and outlined in the way of your question. But let me quickly say that if you have this, this burning curiosity in your personality, in your mind, that you need to learn how things work, you, are, you have a, a level of curiosity that goes beyond the norm, uh, that you're curious, curious, curious about ways to make things better, you are on the road to a successful entrepreneurial journey. So your curiosity, if it's, if it's uh, tempered with the fact that you can't learn everything. You can't know everything that you need to know about whatever field you decided to uh, uh, to plow to build your organization. But your curiosity must never wane. Your curiosity has to be right uh, right in the center of your life. It has to be your, your middle name. And then your perseverance. And, and what I mean by perseverance is understand that you're going to have so much uncertainty, so much ambiguity, so much combustion, so much uh, distrust. You're going as, you even have to deal with envy of people around you who envy the illusion that you've made something out of nothing that gave you the permission to be your own boss or gave you flexibility that you really don't have. So there are a lot of components psychologically and sociologically that play into the whole process of being a successful thinker before you become a, a successful entrepreneur. And so the, the notion of being really aware of how, how big of a, a part of your life, your, your thinking life, is based on curiosity and performance. So I, I, I think those are, the, the, you could probably find five uh, checkpoint list items in there, but curiosity, 
number one. Let me know when the dissertation will be out and I'll have to read it. But it sounds like you're already uh, on track to at least have the first draft by what, tomorrow? No, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> by, by tomorrow. If I, if I didn't have so many Zoom meetings over the next couple of days, I'd, I'd do it. Uh, you know, um, you talk a lot a bit about human behavior and the brains. Yes. That's probably yes. no, no surprise. And... I can't help but notice that you focus a lot on the process of one developing value for the business and other types of ventures as well. I, I want to ask you if you can maybe give a quick minute or two, what are the types of processes, and I know this is a loaded question, that somebody maybe could just start to think about that might change their life? Are there two or three that maybe somebody should maybe take a make a quick gander and say, gee, I'm doing that. Is there something I should do right now to get me out of that rut? I, th I think the number one thing that comes to mind, John, that's an, an interesting question. And, and I, I uh, in various ways of formulation, I, I get that question periodically. And so what I, what I would say really seriously with much of a smile on my face because of the gravitas of the, the importance here, that you have to learn to think deeper, think wider, and think higher about whatever it is you are doing at home, at work, and any part of the community in which you're, you're plugging in your good brain, whether it's in your church, your synagogue, your mosque, your, your fraternal organization, your, uh, your night school, what, whatever it is, think deeper, wider, and higher, because what we have lulled ourselves into by the, the presence of so much technology around us uh, so much, so many YouTube videos, so many uh, TED Talks, is we've lulled ourselves into being entertained, uh, being stimulated by, by uh, technology, uh, not necessarily thinking deeper, wider, and higher about who we are and who we uniquely, uh, 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 what uniquely we bring to the economy, to our communities. From neighborhoods to nations, we have to learn how to be more aware of our opportunity to contribute value and to know what that value is requires that deeper, wider, and higher thinking. I hope that's a, su a sufficient response. No, that's an excellent answer to my question. It almost makes me think of it like we're all a cog in the world, okay? Now, not a typical cog that you'd put on any machine, but a cog that could keep morphing into many different purposes and applications. Well, John, let me let me just say here that we we refer to Enclave Academy as the Cogworks School, not the Hogwarts School, but the Cogworks School. So the cognition is what we're teaching here in terms of uh, not wizardry but leadery, and uh, not witchcraft but thinkcraft. Uh, so no, I didn't know that, John. I just picked that out of the. I just picked that out of my I know, own I mind. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we. We think Harry Potter has taught us a lot because there is magic. And let me let me just quickly mention that there's a sure. lot of luck in entrepreneurship. It's something that we don't necessarily talk about. But keep in mind that no matter how much you think, no matter how much you plan, no matter how much you prepare uh, with your mentors, your coaches, your advisors, your university professors, luck plays a role in your success. The good luck, the bad luck, and the other luck uh, that that happens. So be aware that you have to navigate the unexpected. You have to navigate divine providence. You have to na navigate what we call neuroserendipity, that you'll be sitting there and two neurons in your brain will bump into each other and suddenly clarity will come about something that you've struggled with for months, if, if not longer. And so we have to be aware of the luck, the, the uh, roll of the die, uh, if, if you will, and uh, make sure that we honor that and we, we capture the value out of those moments of unexpected delight for the mind. The mind gets excited when these things happen, if we allow it. And uh, unfortunately, most of us default to easier ways of thinking, easier ways of hiding our delight. And, uh, w and because we, we don't, we're not as comfortable with luck as we should be. And if anybody you know has a successful company where they deny the role of luck in that success, they're lying to you through and through. There's no other way to put it. Luck has played a role in every career. Luck has played a role in every life. 
uh, divine providence, luck, whichever uh, uh, way you want to frame it. But keep it in mind. It's not the only thing, but it is an important thing. Oh, it's an important thing. But, but let me just quickly say the reasons it's important, John, is that that uh, if you accept that, you actually open your mind to possibilities. If you say, no, no, it's not, there's no luck involved. It's my brain. It's my brilliance. It's my IQ. It's my intelligence that's making all this work. Oh, you don't even realize what you're doing to the neuro plasticity of, of the brain. You're like uh, cutting it off to uh, before it has a chance to fully perform. This reminds me, John, I do a motivational tip every single day. And uh, before I get into what the tip was for today, and it kind of resonates to what you're saying, I went out to over a million people about a week ago. And without telling you the platform, within three days, I went to stream. And I went from a 60 second down to a 30 second, to a 50 second, to a seven second. And I couldn't stream at all hmm. on a Sunday after the third day. So being an engineer, I figured it was something technical, figured it was something with the platform. So I decided to just record my video on the phone and upload it the old fashioned way. That worked fine. That night, I went on the platform to do some things. Everything was fine. I tried to click some buttons. I couldn't click the buttons. So I did it from my phone. Then I tried to do some other things on the platform. And a little bit later, I got a notice saying that I had violated a community standard uh. and based on security uh threshold that may have been reached uh my account has been restricted for potential criminal activity so <laughs> Cr criminal activity oh my goodness <laughs> there was nothing criminal being done it was strictly a motivational tip every day of one minute or two and there was no sales involved <laughs> so i said i'm not gonna get angry john i am going to think about a logical way to handle this. So I decided to write a press release. Press release went out. This was uh, that afternoon I wrote the press release. The next day it became one of the number one stories in Silicon Valley, the true huh. cost of social media. You don't own it, you never will. Right. And so, um, you know, that wasn't gonna help me. I mean, that was nice that I did that, but that really wasn't gonna get my account reinstated. I tried calling them, they don't answer the phone. They said it'll be 30 to 60 days. They want me to upload a copy of my passport, my driver's license. I'm like, no way, no way. Hmm. So I said, I need to do something else. I'm not waiting 30 to 60 days. All these people are waiting for my posts. And as it is, I'm losing a day and another day. I said, this is insane. So now it's been two days. I go ahead and I pull a list of this company's uh, investors. Everyone above 1% on the public stock market. Not the board, but the the stock market. And I contacted people like head of the Magellan Fund, different companies, called them on their cell phones. Wasn't selling them anything. And I said, hey, oh, before I did that, I did one thing. I filed a complaint with the Better Business Bureau. Hmm. And then I filed a complaint with the district attorney general's office. And I sent these to every single person. I said, hey, by the way, I just want to let you know I'm nobody, just such and such in this town. And I brought a complaint against one of the people. You invest 14.7% at $18 billion. I just thought you may want to know uh, because you may need to be uh, available to be uh, uh, called for testimony to the court. So I just wanted to make you aware of it. If there's anything you could do, if not, that's fine. But I'm calling all the other investors. Now, while I was doing this, their stock was going down a mm -hmm. little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. The next day I woke up. Now I called 50, 60, whatever it was for that level, called all the people. Some I left messages. I emailed them the next morning, 5.30 in the morning. I clicked on the button without telling you what it is. And I get welcome back to, and I'm like, huh, 49 violations. I click it again. They all disappear. So then I get on my phone that next day, that day. And I went and recorded my video. I said, first, I want to thank all the investors, Better Business Bureau, the Attorney General's office, and of course, blah, 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 um, because uh, you know my account was restricted and they did the right thing. Now, I want to let everybody know that it was not them that really blocked me. I want to thank the two people, uh, knuckleheads, that decided it was fun to report me because I was getting so much publicity. And the next time that anybody does that, 
not only am I going to go after the company and the investors, but I'm coming after you two guys. So I'd watch your step. That next day, John, there was a lull. I got on. I said, I apologize for the delay. My word was deliverance. I said, deliver, promising to deliver. Now, I couldn't deliver because of something outside of my control. But I still took action to be able to make sure I could deliver as soon as possible. People were just blown away. But I share that with you because everyone said to me, well, how'd you get the account reinstated? I said, I just took some creative action. Well, what did you do? I, I filed some. You could do that? I'm like, yeah, I filed a complaint. I did this. And I, oh, that's just crazy. I said, yes, but I got action in 24 hours or less. Today's tip was persistence pays when it comes with passion and integrity. Yes. So when you are in that, recall back to what you were saying about, you know, being involved all the time and doing things. So you can be persistent as much as you want in your life. But if you don't do it with a passion, which is that curiosity I'm hearing you say, which is driving us. Yes. And if you don't do it for the reason of being truthful with integrity, either one of those two things, you're going to fail. So I just thought it kind of resonated with, with what you said. But the other challenge I also see, John, and you might see this a lot in your school, is that sometimes you do something. And everybody, especially a lot of entrepreneurs, they want a pat on the back. And I said, you know, you don't need a pat on the back. But there's another thing you have to learn as an, as an entrepreneur. And I only learned this a few years. And I've been doing this for many years. But I just learned this a few years ago. It's okay, John, if not everyone likes you. Now, I'm not saying people hate me. They like me. But everyone doesn't have to like you. And if everybody does like me, then John's not bringing his A game. <laughs> yeah, you're, not, you're not doing something right if everybody likes you. <laughs> John, do you, do you mind if I just tell you a really quick story? Absolutely, that sure. Let me, let me just tell you that in the mid-1990s, um, we were we had an idea for um, aggregating all of the consumer credit data in the United States from Experian and Equifax and TransUnion. And uh, I knew the CEOs of all three of those uh, big national uh, uh, credit bureaus through work that I was doing for years in New York City. And uh, one of the first things we did to make this uh, a reality is we wanted to make sure that the need existed. So I went out and met with the Federal Trade Commission, which is the uh, government arm that oversees the credit bureaus. I uh, met with the um, uh, Secret Service, with which oversees debit cards because debit cards are cash. Uh, the FTC handles credit cards, which are credit. Uh, and uh, went to uh, uh, ABC, Good Morning America. I went to uh, Money Magazine. I went to the Federal Reserve, met with Larry Summers, who was then the uh, among the uh, governors of the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal reporters in uh, Washington, D.C. And I said to all these people, do you think it would be beneficial for the American public to have one location where they could gain access to all of their credit data? and not credit scores necessarily, but to their credit data. And so they could monitor changes in all three bureaus. And uh, then everybody said universally, yes. And so then I went to the three CEOs and talked very openly about what I discovered in my research. And uh, one of the CEOs, I'll leave him unnamed, but one was quite irritated with me because he felt that I had backed him into a corner. And uh, I, it, that wasn't it. Uh, the fact that I had met with uh, the, the uh, Federal Trade Commission irritated him because I basically had introduced the notion that there's a better way for the American consumer to gain access to that voluminous data. Uh, and and uh, they, they weren't, that particular uh, credit bureau wasn't pleased. But all three of them agreed, eventually agreed. And we broke records with what we did uh, with American Express as our partner, our number one partner, the first uh, uh, organization that uh, said that we were onto something and they in investigated uh, the idea very thoroughly. But we persisted and we persisted and persisted, but we brought in thought leaders. So it wasn't just the, the entrepreneur going out and saying, I think my data, it's saying this organization thinks it's it's the right thing to do. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission couldn't endorse it because they can't do such a thing, 
but they certainly couldn't say anything against it, which is a tacit endorsement, I suppose. Uh, but the uh, Federal Trade Commission and the other organizations were saying, yes, of course, the consumer should have an easy way to gain access. And now it's almost proliferated uh, in terms of different organizations that have caught on to that. But we were the first, and the way we got there was not easy. We had to persist, 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 and we did. We broke all kinds of records in the early stage of that venture in terms of the acceptance of our uh, core value proposition. It was accepted very quickly by the consumers and particularly by all the organizations that we brought in as partners. So this notion of, of interacting with the influencers as you did to overturn that, that uh, uh, seemingly uh, silly uh, em embargo on your use of that platform, uh, you, you brought in the influencers, the people who would think with you about how to overcome your obstacle. And uh, that's what we did. We anticipated the fact that uh, an entrepreneur coming into the big credit bureaus would have no credibility whatsoever if he didn't have around him all these great thinkers, these people who use different types of thinking to come to a conclusion that the American consumer was better served by this methodology of taking good and better care of consumer credit data. Amazing story. I it was, did that. It was intense. It was, it was <laughs> I, just as I told that story, my, my, insti my insides were rumbling and that's, 20, <laughs> that's 25 years ago. It's like uh, just a remarkable. This is only a few weeks ago. I did this, John, because I knew that was what was funding the platform. Okay. And I knew that if they weren't happy, okay, not that that was going to happen immediately, but they would pull funds or stop investing or sell stock. Yes. So I believed that since they had a vested interest in being a major stockholder, that they're probably going to listen to them. I even had sent them faxes and emails and they didn't respond. So when you get to the person that is involved, I always say to people like, you know, you're building an environment or a community. Nobody wants to be on your train in the beginning. They don't want to join you. You're just kind of going along. But when the train becomes a winning train or let's say a horse, right? A winning horse. Everyone wants to be on the winning horse. John, you're, you're absolutely on to something big here. And it, it applies to Apple. I mean, let me just interject because you're, 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 you're spot on. So Steve Jobs, I, I had the privilege of meeting Steve in 1984. The Gartner Group was a client of mine at that point. So I was in Fort Lauderdale for one of their Gartner conferences, which was spectacular. I remember it like yesterday. Uh, but I had IBM as a, as a client. I had IBM equipment in my company in New York City. And uh, I met Steve Jobs, did not like him at all. I thought he was abrasive and difficult. But boy, did I love his Macintosh that he was uh, demonstrating in, in uh, 1984. But when I bought one and I put it on my credenza behind my desk next to my IBM computer that was on the other side of my desk, um, my, my elitist Wall Street buddies were looking at that, that toy Apple on my credenza and saying, why would a person of your stature have a, 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 a tool for students? That's, that's for artists. That's for elementary school kids. Uh, that's built for children. It's not built for us serious of a, adults. And they they did not get on the Apple bandwagon at all. And and it took years before Steve Jobs convinced his naysayers, the people who were going against the Apple vision of what uh, what's going on. But I, I want to just quickly say uh, along these lines that the current edition of Harvard Business Review has an enormously... Um, uh, revelatory, revelatory story about uh, Steve Jobs' mind and how he had to be talked into changing his mind to do the iPhone. That there were people in his organization who, when he said, I don't want to do a phone, and they knew how to change Steve Jobs' mind. And so it's in the current edition of Harvard Business Review. And the reason it's important for our conversation today is that that addition focuses on the importance of mindset, the importance of getting people around you with whom you can have legitimate intellectual uh, cognitive debate 
about something that's good, something that's not so good, uh, something that's neutral that needs to be looked at uh, deeper. But the notion of, of Steve Jobs, of all people, being devalued right in the beginning of his career and then fired, as you know, and then brought back when uh, suddenly they felt that he was mature enough and, and mature of mind, if not personality. So these, these things about how we think things through thoroughly and how we repel and resist and push back on people who have new ideas and new innovations to take uh, the, it's not the reinventing of the wheel, it's the, re the, the, uh, the innovation of the wheel that we do. Uh, over and over again, we do innovation with that wheel, but people push back because they didn't have the idea. They can't relate to it until someone makes it a joint effort. And, and the thinking process of why we envy idea people, why we're envious of a successful entrepreneur, we as a culture, we as a world, uh, have to get over that kind of resistance to change, that resistance to identifying the quality of thinking that somebody who has worked so, so hard, as Steve Jobs did, so hard to have his dream come to life. It wasn't the same same dream. It was tweaked and uh, re reconfigured and pivoted many times. But that energy that's required to come up with these ideas and to test, test, test the, the various uh, assumptions, the uh, various theses behind a, 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 a startup idea, all that goes on before anybody even pays attention. So my recommendation, and I'll just, I'll just close this uh, one minute uh, very quickly by saying, if you know an entre entrepreneur, don't focus on that entrepreneur's idea. Don't focus on that entrepreneur's product or service or the new app that they're developing or the new software package that they're, they're putting together. But focus on the person. Ask if the person is doing all right. Are they getting enough sleep? Are they eating? Are they seeing their doctor? Have they been to a dentist? Uh, how's the marriage going? Uh, the significant other, uh, uh, if they're uh, parents, are they spending enough time with their children? Because a lot of people want to focus on the entrepreneur only when the entrepreneur has a has a million dollars in the bank or a, a, the, the chance of becoming a billion dollar unicorn. We don't focus on the person, we focus on the money, we focus on the venture, the technology, the product, the service. We ask you, we beg you, focus on the entrepreneur as an individual. She or he needs our attention and guess what we need? We need their productivity because they create the jobs. 75% of our, our culture, our, our economy in the United States is driven by small business. Why in the world wouldn't they, we not be paying attention to small business owners who could become the next Apple, the next Microsoft, et cetera? I think, John, it's because of some politics. I think it's because of some people that are jealous. Uh, they're not supporting of the vision. Uh, but this leads me to a very interesting point, and you uh, alluded to it when you talked about what they're eating and stuff like that. We become what we eat, right? So we become a byproduct of the people we hang around. So one of the things I always tell people is if you've got negative energy, uh, you don't have to be nasty to the person. Just politely let them know that you don't appreciate that. If they continue with that behavior, well, then just distance yourself from that person like we're doing now in COVID, but permanently. And they're either going to change their ways or they're going to go the way they are, but you're not going to be in their life anymore. Uh, I think it's really key that when you choose to associate with people, you want to know what they're about. You don't have to know everything personally about them, but you want to know a little about their ideals, their goals. What kind of person are they? I think that's really important, especially with other entrepreneurs connect. John, let me let me just uh, put a finer point on that. You're, you're on the right track, but the, the point that comes out of what we do here at Enclave Learning and Earning Center is that it's how the person thinks. And so if you want to get to know somebody, just say to say the following question, like, how did you think about that? I mean, you started this business. What were you thinking? How were you thinking? And, and the, the notion of, of listening to somebody explain how they think, you get to learn a lot about that person. Uh, try to avoid the small talk. I mean, small talk has its place but its place is small. 
so get right into the the, the nitty gritty of it and and say, I, I, I want to talk about how you how you think. I mean, are 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 you an a analytical thinker? Are you a strategic thinker? Um, how do you characterize the type of thinking that allows you to deal with all the ambiguity, all the uncertainty, all the the combustion that's part of your venture that you're running so successfully? But in a networking uh, situation with a smile on your face, you can't, you don't want to intimidate, but you can just say, oh, you know, that's fascinating. I, I love that thought. How were you thinking when? when that thought popped into your, your great mind or something of that nature. And you'll be surprised how, how people welcome the opportunity to say, well, that wasn't easy to think about. I had to think really hard. And I brought in mentors. I brought in consultants. I brought in uh, coaches to help me think, wow, there's a breakthrough. And suddenly you learn the person by how they think. That reminds me of a very famous author who made a comment um, you ask a question, you know, that's interesting you responded that way. I was just curious, how did you come up with that answer? Or what made you think of it that way? And it makes it more fun, more playful, or very similar to what, what you're saying is we don't think about the how, we just get the answer, but we don't think about all the, uh, let's call it the, you know, the intricacies that go into the byproduct of thought to give us the answer. That's exactly right. Ye years ago, there was an interview with uh, Jay Leno, if I recall correctly, or maybe it was uh, David Letterman uh, interviewing a, uh, a very well-known Hollywood star. And I'm not going to mention his name. I don't, don't want any problems with that. But this Hollywood star had done something very, very stupid in his private life in a very a very uh, uh, disgusting way in uh, in Hollywood. And so the joke uh, that, that became a meme on, on uh, social media was the question that, I think it was Letterman actually, Letterman said, what were you thinking? And the, the audience in the studio just fell apart laughing when the question was asked, what were you thinking? How could a man of your stature with your success do something like that? What were you thinking? The question that should have been asked that would have been productive for everybody watching and especially for the person who had to respond, was how were you thinking? And there's a high probability that he would come back, come back and say, I wasn't thinking. I, I wasn't thinking at all. I was reacting to an opportunity. I was reacting to, but they were thinking. They just weren't thinking deeply, uh, broadly, and, and in an elevated fashion enough to know that what he was about to do could have cost him his career. And so the notion of asking people, what were you thinking is not nearly as instructive in a networking environment or a getting to know you environment in your private life as how were you thinking when you decided to marry that person or date that person or buy that house or buy that type of car, whatever it is, how were you thinking? They may not have a ready answer, but you've planted a seed for them to remember from now on to think about how they think, as opposed to what they think. When we stop at what we think, we cut off our brain's ability to expand itself and to, to roam and come up with better, uh, better solutions to the problems that we, we are encountering. So the question is, how are you thinking, not what are you thinking? It's always, always the better question to ask. I like where you're going. Let's give the audience an example because I think we've talked in semantics. Let's try to give an example of what you're actually talking about, because okay. I think what you're talking about is brilliant, but a lot of our viewers might not quite be able to encapsulate what we're really talking about. Oh, so the, the example that I would give is when you have an idea for a new uh, company, uh, somebody will say, well, uh, well, tell me about the idea. What is that app? supposed to do? Um, what is that that new software? Uh, what problem is that software solving? The better question is, how did you come up with this? What did you observe? What did you see in the marketplace? What did you see in the customer experience uh, that, that caused your brain to think in a certain way? Uh, did you immediately see the opportunity? Uh, and uh, most people will say, no, I didn't immediately see the opportunity. I immediately saw the problem 
And then after I thought about it, well, how did you think about it? Well, I thought about it analytically. I thought about all the people who are losing their their uh, uh, their uh, uh, money, losing their their traction in the marketplace by doing this thing, whatever the thing was, doing the thing the wrong way. So I I thought about it analytically, and then I kicked into thinking about it creatively. Well, what could I come up with? What I could what could I create? What could I find that simply needs innovation? Is there something out there already? Is there a technology, a methodology, a practice that by innovating, by making it better, by by pivoting it into a different direction, repurposing uh, some existing technology that I could use uh, to solve this problem? So the 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 uh, the practical application is if we see a problem, to create the solution, we have to know how we're going to think about it. And the very first thing we have to do is apply, as I said earlier, curiosity. I want to dig into that problem as much as the internet, as much as my circle of friends, as much as my library at home or my library in my neighborhood will allow me to dig into that problem and find out what's causing that problem. And so that's the, the investigatory type of thinking that people need to, to use before they start to build their ideas. And a lot of us don't do that. We don't we don't invest that kind of cognitive energy. This reminds me of an inventor that I learned about uh, not too long ago. And they had a product that a professional would use every day. Unfortunately, when you knock the product over, to have it fixed could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to have it fixed. And a new one might cost even more. So this one particular person said this is becoming a problem and they developed something to put around the device so that when you knock it over, it doesn't break 99% of the time. If you hit it a little bit different to the corner, it's probably going to break. But if you hit it the way most people would just straight over, it doesn't break. And they were able to come up with a device. I think it's like $40. It's a piece of plastic that you put over the like almost like a little boot. And uh, it seems very simple, but then they had to make them for different sizes. But something like that happened because somebody was frustrated of constantly having someone fix something right. every time they needed right. it. Yes. So I think that's why a lot of products we see out there happen or get built because somebody's frustrated with a problem. Well, that's, that, 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 that's true, John, but, but, but the uh, curiosity part of that equation that you just talked about is uh, just to dig deeper than the obvious. So something mm -hmm. gets knocked over, uh, and, and there are so many stories about that very scenario that you're talking about, That and Jeff Bezos uh, uh, did this recently in a production um, line in, at uh, Amazon, uh, but the, the, the first thing you see is not usually the cause that you're going to have to address. So the very first, the most obvious thing that you think about what caused that item to knock over or push over or fall over, uh, there's there's usually something else. But your curiosity, if you don't have it, if you're not a curious individual, you'll take the first thing that comes into view. You take the easy way out, and then you build a product that wasn't needed. I, I built it in 1974. I built a, a, a technology product uh, back long before people were talking about technology the way we do today. And uh, somebody had the nerve to say, John, you've built an elegant solution to a non-problem. <laughs> and that was one of the most irritating phrases. I will remember it till the day I die. Uh, uh -huh. it, it was, I, I, and I, to, because my arrogance at age 24 was, I would not have built an elegant solution to a non-problem. I would build a solution to a problem that nobody else had figured out how to solve. And this was a problem that Wall Street had dealt with for generations. And I saw it with my fresh eyes as I got there uh, at age 23. I saw something that was way out of whack. And I thought, how can this new technology, this new computing technology uh, apply to what's going on in Wall Street when they were still using the, the handwritten uh, chits and all the things that were going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange back then? and how institutional investors were reading research reports, none of it added up to my, my inexperienced eyes, but I certainly didn't uh, 
create a, a an elegant solution to a non-problem. And I built a multi-million dollar business out of that that I ran for 12 years and sold uh, paradoxically to a Wall Street firm. So it was uh, it was a fascinating journey to watch how people push back and push back until what happened? Until they bought it, they understood it. And when we had 27 of the top uh, companies in the world as clients, and 25% of my stock was owned by a CEO of one of the top 10 companies in the world, uh, all of a sudden, that elegant solution became an essential solution to a very real problem. But the key was getting people to understand it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes no, nothing, no, no matter how I would simplify the message or uh, build the message out, uh, what they wanted to focus on and when people default to focus on is how much money are you making? Who uses it? Uh, when we would sell that, that particular company, a lot of people in our sales process would simply say, who are your customers? And my sales team, a remarkable, I remember so many of them, and especially my vice president of sales, Mark Farley, who's now with a big Wall Street firm. But uh, the way our sales team was, was uh, trained in our fourth or fifth year was to laugh and smile with the prospect and simply say, well, name a big company here in New York City. And the prospect would say, what do you mean name a big company? Well, just name one. And usually they would say AT&T or IBM or a company of that nature. And we were trained with a, a degree of faux humility just to nod and nod. And they said, now you, you can't have all those. Oh, we do. You have all those companies? We do. And, and so the, the, the fact that they weren't really as interested in what we had to offer, they were interested in who was validating the value. Exactly. Isn't that something? They and always so, ask you, well, who's using your product? That's the number one question. Well, how many have you sold? Yeah. But even if they don't ask how many of you sold, well, who else is using your product? That's exactly right. And when we had, just as a, a quick aside, we had ABC and, and uh, uh, NBC as clients from the very beginning of our, our work. And we had published the presidential debates in 1976, uh, 1980, and 1984 through this right. technology. And, uh, but we couldn't get CBS. And, and then uh, finally, I went into CBS and, and uh, spoke very plainly. I said, we have ABC, we have NBC. The only, the only of the three big networks back then we didn't have was CBS. And they said, well, you know, we love what you're doing, but we can't exactly call those two competitors of ours and say, how, <laughs> how, how is John, John's company performing? And I simply said this. I said nothing more, nothing less. A lot of your advertisers are our customers. And the fellow at CBS just looked at me and he said, oh, I didn't think of that. So a lot of your advertisers <laughs> are validating what we're doing on Wall Street and how it's having an impact on their stock price. Uh, so uh, so and, all, and, and when, when I sold the company, just parenthetically, uh, there was a very large uh, uh, party at the 21 Club in New York that was hosted and paid for by CBS. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they, they were really quick to say, oh, you taught us a lesson. You taught us a lesson. But again, it wasn't necessarily about uh, who we were. It was about who was validating what we were claiming. And uh, that's, a, that's a difficult journey for an entrepreneur. It's very, very tough. John, this has been really remarkable talking with you. Uh, we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask you, is there anything you'd like to share with our viewers, either to reach out to you, social media or your podcast? Is there somewhere or a LinkedIn that you'd like our viewers to connect with you if you wish? Well, you're, you're very kind. I, I have my uh, my Twitter ID on the screen right now. And please, uh, the, the Twitter page is uh, populated with 21,000 tweets that are original tweets. Very rarely have we retweeted somebody else's um, tweet by itself. Uh, but there's every single day, there are one to five tweets about how to think deeper, wider, and higher about being an entrepreneur, being a leader, being a business owner, sometimes even being a, a podcast host. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do encourage people, uh, just uh, re reach out and, uh, and uh, find out what Enclave is all about. It's Enclave for Entrepreneurs dot com enclave for entrepreneurs dot com and just just in, enjoy the even if you don't visit here you're welcome uh, it's a beautiful place it's fifteen thousand square feet on 
three levels right next door to O'Hare International Airport. Uh, we'll send a car for you and bring you over if you're flying through and you have a layover. But come and learn about the psychology and the sociology of the entrepreneurial experience. Uh, focusing on the business plan, we don't do. We focus on the competence plan. Just how is that brain working? How is how is that life working that has to fuel our economy? So I, I really encourage you to, to uh, uh, connect with me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, my full name, John R. Dallas Jr., uh, also on uh, Facebook and uh, in uh, uh, Pinterest, uh, Amazon. There, I, I wrote a book called We Need to Have a Word, and you can go on Amazon Authors to take a look at our background and, and uh, some of the things that are going on here. But I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be with you, John, and thank you for all those excellent questions. Well, it was a pleasure to have such a knowledgeable gentleman like yourself be able to give uh, me and as well as many of our viewers today uh, some guidance. And we are now on Princeton uh, Community TV, uh, which we do want to thank them as well. So we have a new expanded audience. So definitely want to thank those. And we're looking to expand to different communities. So again, if you have a, a college in your area and you'd like us to be on your network, reach out to us. We would love to put our show uh, on your TV. So again, yes, John, thank you very yeah, much. Just so go it's for Princeton, it. it's Princeton Community, which is the actual the 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 network for Princeton. So it's not the college; it's actually Princeton Community TV. So, but a lot of the college people do listen, and it is on the the uh, cable boxes of the town. The schools don't have access to the cable, so we're looking for people that have that inter access channel. The colleges many times don't have it, but the towns do, and it becomes like the the uh, colleges channel. John, one of my, uh, among my warmest memories are down in Princeton. Many times I've attended seminars down there and sp have spoken down there. So uh, Princeton, New Jersey, one of my favorite spots of the East Coast. Well, again, John, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being on our show today. And thank you. It's been
Wow, Marcus. What did you think of uh, Mr. John R. Dallas's interview with me? Just I know the type of things that he teaches, you know, entrepreneurs' minds and how to really harness and cultivate things. Our mind is so powerful, Marcus. Brilliant. Just and uh, absolutely brilliant. if more people would understand that and take the time to train it, just like so many people train their bodies, the amount of things they could do would just be off the charts. And so what I want you to understand is that people have that choice today. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Marcus? Yeah, I absolutely, uh, absolutely agree. You know, just so much to learn. It's so absolutely to amazing. Away. Yeah. And uh, very grateful for Mr. John R. Dallas to take time and uh, speak with us uh, tonight and educate us on some of these nuances that I think a lot of us just sort of, um, you know, just let blip right by. Well, our good friends, Google, um, as you know, are changing their storage policy on June 1st, 2021. That's right. The unlimited bucket goes away and we now have 15 gigabytes of storage on your account. In case you wanted to read more about it, you can just Google um, basically uh, photo uh, Google photo uh, storage policy. And you'll be able to read a nice long uh, winded <laughs> set of uh, pages explaining this. Yeah. So that's one thing. Pages. And, you know, I want to talk about something else, Marcus, that I think is really cool. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of us out there love gadgets. I do, too. But yeah. sometimes, you know, we buy a gadget and this gadget is actually something that basically just goes in the closet. Well, I had the opportunity to unbox. And for those of you who don't know, we have the Jmore unboxing channel. You can get that uh, on YouTube. You can get it on Facebook. Just Jmore space unboxing and review it. That's all one on Facebook. And so we did an unboxing of the Seraphim Kibo, but then uh, just a few days ago, we actually did a review of the Seraphim Kibo. So for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a laser keyboard. Um, and it's a little tiny uh, little cube basic thing. And so um, this cube is neat. And so, you know, you think if you're paying some money for it, it's gonna be great. Well, not always. I think I paid just over a hundred and some bucks for it. And so you basically take the little cable out, plug it into your computer and you can charge it up. Now you can use it um, plugged in or you can use it uh, Bluetooth once you've uh, charged it. Hmm. So what is this thing? It's a little little, little cube, kind of like you press a button and then you can basically set your phone down in it. And you could also use it on your computer. And what it does is it's a projection keyboard. So when you set it down, the keyboard actually projects out towards your body. And so when you start typing on it, you'll definitely want to check out my review. It's just not all that it's cracked up to be. Mm. It's a fad. Uh, wow. You get a nice little red keyboard. This one, you could change the, you know, the language very easily. It's just not very practical. Oh. Um, you know, being an engineer, I type a lot. And this keyboard does not have the slightest bit of, um, I'm going to call it tactility um, <laughs> because it's just not there. And wow. uh, to give you another example, there's a neat little app that you can download uh, that lets you actually um, simulate a keyboard. And so instead of showing a keyboard like we'd see for our computer, it simulates uh, a piano keyboard. And you're figuring this is great. Well, I thought so too. Now I play piano, but when I started with this, I thought I never played piano in my life. I was doing the simple scales, one, two, three, four, five, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, and then also, ba, ti, do, back to, to pack again. And so yeah, I also did the larger scale, one, two, three, thumb, one, two, four, five, one, two, three, four, three, two, one. And so when you're doing that, I expected it to work just like my key, uh, keyboard or my piano does. It didn't. I was trying to type little things and, you know, go check it out. I think you're going to find it pretty amazing. But what I want you to understand is that this product falls into the category of fad. Yes, F-A-D. That's something you buy either because you think it's hot or cool for the moment. Then you use it and realize it's not really all that it's cracked up to be. And you either return it or you actually put it on the shelf or in a closet somewhere. And you probably never take it out again.
And it's usually one of those things that you give away to somebody and they think it's, oh, it's great. And then they play it for a little while and the same kind of chain of reaction uh, feeling happens. <laughs> I'm sure you've never had a product like that or a toy like that, Marcus, right? <laughs> no. So I, I guess what I want to explain to you is that this is a nice product in proof of concept, right. but it really doesn't work. Mm. So when you try to actually do it, it just you can't type. I mean, it it, it, it misses keys and stuff wow. like that. And it even has a player piano built in. So when you load the app, you can choose like Can and D and you can watch it playing. And I'm like, there is no way in the world that you could ever play uh, Canon and D with that virtual keyboard. Again, it's a projected keyboard. It's a, it's a red light. I wish that it had different colors because maybe you don't want red. And I know that gets expensive for lasers, but I would have liked to see something different. You know, maybe I would have liked to see a blue or something else. So I would have liked to have the option. I might have raised the price tag. And it also has a sensor in the back. So, mm. you know, when you uh, are typing, you stop, the laser stops for a while. Then when you come back, it restops. So there's a little button on there so that, you know, it restarts. So you can turn it on, turn it off. It was neat. It worked with my phone. Um, but what I want to tell you is that when I linked it to my phone, I couldn't use my phone for any other function. Because oh, when you link wow. the Bluetooth function, just like you do with your uh, headset, well, you can't use the speaker. But what I would have liked to see is the ability to be able to use the Bluetooth for the keyboard and the phone so I could do both. But I think that's a limitation of the Bluetooth. I bet they could fix that, but they just didn't. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed this show as much as I have. I mean, we have some great guests coming up uh, that I'm going to just tell about, tell you about so that you can definitely decide to you know tune in. We just have so much uh, great stuff happening. I want to share with you some more channels that we're releasing. We're also releasing the Envision Networking channel. Uh, it's a science channel every Friday where we talk about how to network. And we do science experiments that explain concepts that might not get through some people's thick head. So this is why we do experiments. So it's like, oh, wow. And then they never forget it. So when you make something fun and interesting, People just, they sort of want to remember things and then they tell other people about those things. So uh, that's what we're doing. And uh, you definitely want to check this out. And so another thing I want to share with you is our guest lineup, because we have, when I tell you some amazing guests coming up, we have some amazing guests coming up. And so one of the guests that we have coming up uh, is actually coming up very, very soon. Uh, and that is, you guessed it. On um, the 21st, that's Krista Botsford Crotty. She owns a small business. And so we're going to learn how she's been affected during COVID. I thought that was something interesting, you know, to hear about. Uh, a little further down in the month, uh, we have Sarah Robertson coming on. And so she is another amazing person. She wow. actually is going to talk to us about your child's soundbite. When you apply to get into college, do you actually write the information or do your parents write it for you? And if that's the case, is your soundbite that your parents are portraying matching the soundbite of the student? There really should just be one soundbite. You have to wow and impress uh, the uh, admissions people. And she was part of that team. So I think you're going to really enjoy that. We're going to talk about her book. So you're definitely not going to want to miss that. Uh, then we're out of the month of May, Marcus. I, I, I cannot believe that. In June, so you know what's hot and coming up, uh, we have Brian O'Neill, who's going to talk to us about a user experience in design. And uh, he's actually a musician, and we're going to talk to him about how he decided to go into this very interesting path. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Hutchison coming up a little bit later in the month, uh, giving his views about COVID and some of the truths that we need to know about. And we have another great guest coming up who is uh, known uh, quite a bit. Um, and that is Sheila Mack. And uh, she is an amazing person. She is also a serial entrepreneur. Yes. Hmm. So we get some great people. And uh, we're going to talk about her great bo book that she wrote. And so I don't know if you guys know this, but whenever I get guests on the show, I actually read the books from cover to cover. And so that's really important so that when my guest comes on the show, I have great questions to, to ask them. I have Andre Ruiz, who is a coach that's coming on to talk to us a little bit about life. So that's going to be very interesting. Uh, another guest I want to share with you that is coming up is on July 9th. We have Catherine Leonard, 
who's going to talk about, you know, what do we do when our head is kind of like all over the place, mm -hmm. right? Well, here's some mental hack she's going to share with us. That's and nice. uh, you're not going to want to miss that. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you have an idea for a Jay Moore Tech Talk show, just go over to jaymore.com, click on the Reach Out Us button in the top right corner, and go ahead and fill out the form and submit that to us. Remember that if you do request to be on our show, it is not a sales show, so you must provide valid um, information that is educational, or we are going to decline uh, your request to be on the show. If you have a product that you'd like us to unbox, all you need to do is send us that product and donate it to us. It does become our property, and we will go ahead and unbox it later on. We'll do a review. We'll even possibly invite you to come on the show uh, to talk to you uh, about what we thought about it and maybe give you some suggestions. So if you're open to that and interested, do check out jmor.com. And for those of you that don't know, you can go to jmor.com under social, check out all of our shows, and also get a complete transcript of the show by reading everything that we have basically typed from every syllable and word that is spoken on our show. Marcus, it has come to that magical yeah, time we're here. when I think we have to say goodbye. I know we really don't want to, but we need to. So I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you, your family, your friends, your colleagues, uh, a very safe, a very relaxing and peaceful, wonderful weekend that I hope inspires you to have an even better week that's not only going to help you, but it's going to help others become a better version of themselves and, of course, help you become a better version of yourselves because that's what we're all here, ladies and gentlemen. We're all here to help ourselves become better and to help others become a better version of ourselves. And that's what makes life so amazing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure being your host here tonight, and I will be back next week, same time. Marcus, I guess we got to say goodbye, right? Yeah. We'll say goodbye, and we'll see you next week. Enjoy, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, get ready to uh, read some information. If you happen to miss it or you want to go back and replay one of these shows, feel free to do that because there's a lot of information that we put in these shows. And I think you'll learn a lot more uh, than just watching it once. So have yourself a great rest of the night and, of course, a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you next week. into the technology show where we answer your questions about how technology is supposed to work and sometimes why you have challenges getting it to work that way for more it support and tips just text it support to triple eight triple one that's it support to triple eight triple one and you'll get tips on technology i'll see you next week right here on the J Moore tech talk show Remember, jmor.com.